fantastic to have you join us um, this afternoon uh, at this session. Uh, it will be a, a duo, with myself, Oliver Seal, and we'll introduce ourselves in a moment, and supported uh, by my co-facilitator, Professor Dolores Godedo. Um, it's good to be here. I think the session, as you will note from the program, talks about leadership learning communities and how important that is um, in the work that we do. Um, what we will do is we'll start the session by introducing ourselves and talk a little bit about um, our work, our respective research and work that we do in respect of what we do at home and um, what Dolores then do at CCAS. Then we'll give you some background um, to uh, the, uh, the organizations that we represent and that we, we, we work with. And then we'll go through a series of, of issues that we will discuss um, for the rest of the session. We want this to be interactive. Uh, the important thing is that you engage with us. I always say the best uh, outcome from a session like this is the dynamic in the room, is the contributions that are made because we'll never be in the same space or in the same place again as a group. So, so make, make use of that. You can make your comments and questions. You can place them in the chat um, on the platform that you are viewing from, and we will relay them to our technology support person, will relay them to myself and Dolores. Um, let me give Dolores an opportunity to introduce herself, and then I'll tell you a little bit about me and, and the HELM program. Thank you. Over to you, Dolores. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my time is morning, so it is morning. Um, so I'm Dolores Guerrero, and I am a dean at uh, a university in the United States in Texas, uh, Texas A&M University, Kingsville, um, dean for a college of arts and sciences. Um, the college is, um, it includes arts, humanities, sciences, social sciences, and clinical sciences. Um, we, I also have a museum under the umbrella. So um, my involvement with, um, with CCAS, which is the Council of Colleges of Arts and Sciences, comes connected to that. We're a organization of deans. Um, I am currently, as of a few weeks ago, um, I am serving as president for CCAS. Um, and uh, similar to Helm, we are committed to uh, leadership development and ongoing support for deans um, across the United States and some international uh, members also. Um, so that's a brief introduction for me. Um, I'll be talking about CCAS a little more um, in, in our next section. Thank you very much, uh, Dolores. And I must say, uh, we've been in partnership with uh, CCAS for more than a year. This is the first opportunity we have to co-host an event and it's been fantastic. Um, I was sitting through a session yesterday, some of you were there and was a session host by CCAS uh, with deans. I mean, there was a dean in the US, uh, there's Dolores, there was a dean in Singapore, a dean in South Africa, and a dean in Australia, you know, on the same platform talking about lots of similar issues and challenges. I think one of the great things of technology is it kind of level the playing field in terms of how we connect and how we can interact in real time with each other. So I'm Oliver Seal. I, I head up the Higher Education Leadership and Management Program. Uh, my own background is I, I, I used to refer to myself as a leadership development practitioner, uh, still at heart, but nowadays uh, an emerging scholar in this space. I think um, it was interesting in an earlier session, uh, we've talked about this, I found this in my own research also, that there's not enough scholarship around the important roles of, of bridging in, in the academy and the administration as in deanship. I think people assume often that you've got the skill set because you're a good academic leader or, or a senior researcher or a fantastic professor that you can transcend, transcend or transition uh, into a, a management role, um, you know, uh, in, in the university. And that, as we know from experience, is not the case. So what I'll do now is, as I mentioned earlier, we'll structure the session with some background. For those of you who don't know Helm or CCAS, we'll set the context for you. And I think that's going to be important. And then Dolores and I, for the remainder of the session, we'll, we'll engage uh, with, with some issues. And hopefully you will join us in this. We, we strongly encourage you to participate um, and share your comments, your thoughts, your questions, 
your, your possible solutions or answers <laughs> in the chat as we go along. Let me start by sharing my screen. Higher education, leadership and management, HELM as we know it, um, is a program that's hosted by Universities South Africa, University of South Africa, a national uh, association of the 26 public universities um, in South Africa. Um, and the board of University of South Africa are the vice chancellors, which will be similar to the presidents um, of public universities in the US. Today, we'll be talking about, Dolores and I will be talking about building community <laughs> leaders and reflexive conversations. And I think it does set the tone for how we engage further. And I think the fact that we found in a, you know, what people now call a new normal, although a number of us don't really know what normal is anymore, uh, post-COVID, or uh, you know, that things are changing quite, quite dramatically. And that was the kind of constant refrain we've been hearing for the last uh, two days or so. University of South Africa, umbrella body I mentioned, um, we work with our member universities, uh, promote uh, values-driven, uh, mission relevance and responsiveness, shape and secure the sustainability of our system. Um, our, our system, our, our, our new education system has been in place since early 2000s. And since then, I can't remember a period of, of more than three years that we weren't without crisis of one sort or another. So it's still a fairly new uh, system since 1994, post-democracy, and still finding its feet, but still massively challenged uh, from access, differentiation, sustainability, uh, you know, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So we try and strengthen the capacity of, of, of our universities, we build and support uh, and, 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 and advance effectiveness. And then I think the whole notion of creativity and innovation, I think we saw that uh, at the system level in South Africa, how creative our universities became when in some respects, they, they had to react very swiftly and swift from uh, the switch from face-to-face -face learning um, to online learning and technology-mediated learning. And the differentiation articulation, we're still grappling with that. I think, unlike in the US, where there's a well-established connection between the college system in the US and the higher education university system, we're grappling with that. And, and I think, the, the, although we talk about a, 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 a public uh, sector for education and training, a post-secondary education sector and training, um, we still, uh, the college sector is still very underdeveloped and the differential or the articulation of universities still remain a challenge. And then of course, the new technology moment, um, I think this notion of 4IR, um, you know, I think um, uh, that's coming up uh, talks about the digital university as if we never talked about this before. And so those are kind of things that we, we, we try and influence as USAF. We try and, and support our universities and, and we, we, we advocate uh, for, for policies and, and, and change with our, our, our key principles in government and other stakeholders. What is HELM all about? HELM is an acronym for education leadership and management. Uh, we take responsibility uh, on behalf of, of University of South Africa for macro level leadership development. Now, in some instances, again, that's the differentiation of our system. Some of our universities have really good in-house programs that they do for their heads of departments, uh, for, for some of their senior professors. Um, and we try and complement that with what we do at home at a macro and a national level. More often than not, most or many universities don't have those in our programs. So they find uh, a space and a place uh, for, their, for their senior academic leaders, middle academic leaders and emerging leaders, um, uh, managers uh, within the helm suite of programs. Uh, I, I think importantly, uh, what we do in helm is undergirded by research. Um, and policy and practice. I think that intersection between research and, and, and praxis is key. I think we, we need to, have, because we, we academic, we intellectual knowledge institutions that you have to have a very strong theoretical underpinning when you pursue a praxis like leadership and leadership development, uh, especially in the university space. Our program curriculum design, architecture and pedagogy, uh, as we, we talk about being uh, bespoke and context specific, um, it's not a one size fits all. And, and one of our, our flagship programs that we've now developed, as mentioned earlier by Prof. Rensberg, a women in leadership program that's been around now for three years. And of course, because it was new, 
it's now evolved, given the inputs from the participants and, of course, those who, who, who kind of delivered and designed and conceptualized the program. I think the one uh, big plus for us, because we are we are uh, connected and we we we, we draw our, our our resident debt from University of South Africa, uh, is that we can draw from our universities uh, for partnerships and collaborations. So the number you'll see the associates that are that are that are part of HUM are all are current or former executives or senior managers or experts uh, in their field uh, in our university system. And that helps because often we see this mismatch used to happen. Uh, I mean, I remember a decade ago, universities having been forced to kind of do leadership development events, which get these uh, private providers coming in. And, and I used to say, you know, quite, quite uh, facetiously, uh, they used to come and uh, import their private provider program, which they do with corporates and industry for universities and where they had private there, which is public uh, and I hope that will fly. And often it was a miss. Um, and I think that's the challenge where we need to get to a point where we understand the context, we understand the, the environment and we develop programs that speaks to that particular need. We also, through our, our, our organizational support, and we talked earlier in the session about organizational development, we have a concept called the lab. So it's the HE lab and, and projects that are new that executives are taking on that we're planning to do through the lab. One of the big projects that we're currently working on, it's called ULEFU, it's U-L-E-F-U. Uh, it stands for University Learning Futures Project. And that's where we're working with, with uh, the traditional HDIs. There's eight of them in our higher education system, our historically disadvantaged institutions to help build them and to strengthen their technology uh, uh, mediated learning and, and digital transformation strategies. And then, of course, besides the, the local engagements and support from our universities, we also have international partnerships um, and being CCAS is one of those partnerships that we have established and we look forward to building uh, on that with, with ACE and others in the future. Uh, I think you've seen this before, if you were at the session yesterday, I talked about this, uh, I, uh, I think Patrick, uh, also earlier, Patrick Fitzgerald alluded to this, how underprepared we are when we go into academic leadership. And, and, and I think as a scholar, it's really disconcerting for me because often in academic leadership, it's a pivotal role. Um, it really holds the whole uh, academic project together and it's hugely neglected, neglected in the sense that uh, there's inadequate preparation from the start. There's very little, if any, support while you're there. And nobody bothers really what happens when, when you leave. And I think that is, 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 is tantamount to, to, to the problems and the challenges that we face. And I think this is something that our universities need to address head on. Just to show you how we work in terms of our, our, our training, uh, how we prepare. This was a training needs analysis we did for deans before we started developing the deans program. You see the bigger bubbles, uh, the shift from what we used to call the kind of hard skills into the more uh, softer skills, while well, still strategic planning management, but more HR people, uh, team building, uh, and so on and so forth. And that forms for us the basis of what we, we normally uh, would offer uh, for, for programs for a specific level or role of an audience. There's our architecture, and you'll see I won't spend too much time on it. It speaks for itself. Underpinned by research, interventions are context-specific and supported by professional advisory services from our induction onboarding program through a very series of, of programs to specializations. Uh, we, uh, we talked about uh, we're doing a lecturer's development program next year because we realize the pool for leadership, you should start as early as possible, even with lecturers. Uh, and when you get good lecturers, you get better program coordinators, you get better program coordinators, you get better uh, heads of programs, uh, heads of departments, and so on and so forth. Working on a master's and a postgraduate diploma, which we'll be offering uh, in, in two or three years or so from now, and then a coaching and mentoring program and an online webinar series called Engage. That's me, and I would like to hand over to uh, Dolores, who will give you an introduction to the work of CCAs. Over to you, Dolores. Please tell me when I need to move your slide. Okay, thank you. So um, the Council of uh, Colleges of Arts and Sciences, um, we work, we are a network of deans. Um, and I think to, to kind of um, speak off of what, what Oliver was just saying, I think in, in higher education, um, the preparation um, and the importance of that. And really at the end of the day is to help people be successful. Um, for the 
individual, as a professional, and then for the institution and the organization that they're part of. So um, you can change to the next one. Um, our tagline is empowering deans. You know, that's our, 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 um, our vision, our, our purpose is hopefully to provide the skills, uh, the preparation, the support, the network um, for deans to be successful. Um, and to empower them as they, in their work, um, because that's an impact across all the multiple systems, which impacts faculty, students, um, staff, and, and the university itself, the institution. So CCAS was founded in 1965. Uh, we're a national organization, a national association. And our purpose is, as I said earlier, is to provide professional development programming to our uh, member deans. Um, and we also want to sustain and advocate for the arts and sciences. Um, arts and sciences as colleges, generally across most campuses deliver over 50% of all academics are covered under that umbrella. Um, so that, that's a lot of impact and effect that we can have um, and that we want to make sure we provide to our uh, member institutions, our membership deans. Now we have 500 universities that are members uh, with about 1900 deans and associate assistant deans. Um, and so it, it's a large number. Um, we do have once a year, we have an annual meeting, uh, but throughout the year, and we'll talk a little more about that, throughout the year, we provide um, ongoing um, development opportunities. Um, we have seminars for deans. Uh, we also provide training for department chairs, um, for new chairs. Again, very comp very similar. We, we want to provide the tools um, for, um, for, for our deans and our chairs to be in academics, to be successful um, as, as administrators and as leaders. Um, it's kind of a dual you know, it's learning the administrative components um, plus the leadership component. So um, we currently are host institution. We have a host in institution and that's Texas A&M University in San Antonio. Um, I currently serve, as I said earlier, as president and we are governed by a uh, board of directors, um, which consists of officers and 12 directors um, we're, that are elected on three-year terms. Um, our officers and board members are from the membership. Uh, Amber Cox is our executive director um, and she helps us to uh, stay on top of everything because uh, again, it is staffed. We're a board of directors and we all are deans. Um, so this past year, um, actually right before the pandemic, uh, we were, uh, we've crafted uh, a new strategic plan, a new five-year strategic plan. Uh, it got delayed about a year with everything that happened. And so we are in the midst of launching our new uh, strategic plan. We had an annual meeting this couple weeks ago. Uh, we presented that to the membership and uh, we held some open forums, some video Zoom meetings uh, the months before to kind of go over uh, goals and get in input from our membership. Um, so again, empowering deans to lead is our, our purpose, our mission. Um, we have four goals. Uh, our goal one is pro providing professional development resources, best practices and networking opportunities. Again, that is, it is a key part of what, what we are committed to and are focused on doing. Um, our second goal is to foster inclusive excellence and respond to current issues. Um, there's, and number three is advocate for liberal learning and encouraging academic innovation. Um, and the fourth one is building organizational infrastructure for sustained success. That's kind of our internal goal in terms of organizational structure. Um, as I Again, this is a, a visual of our, of our four goals as we're moving forward. Um, the providing professional development resources, best practices and networking opportunities. We, 
really expanded quite a bit, again, with moving to Zoom and utilizing that, um, that platform, um, we found that we were able to really expand. Um, we've, we've had uh, weekly discussions for deans, um, and it is an open kind of uh, opportunity for deans to, that's usually facilitated by a volunteer dean, um, specific topics, which can vary and deans can sign in, be part of the discussion. And we structure that on a almost weekly basis and have a, a you know, schedule for, for that. So we started that during COVID and it was very well received. Um, so it is, we used to have, we have a listserv where deans can ask questions and have com ongoing conversations with each other about uh, an administrative policy, or how did you do this? Um, so we've got a listserv, we've got that conversation, uh, but and we'd had that for years, uh, but we're, we were able to create these um, virtual uh, meetings or discussions and informal gatherings, and we found that they were very uh, well received, and we've continued that. So we've and we've also added, we used to do pretty much in-person uh, seminars, trainings. Um, we now do a mix of online virtual seminars and in-person seminars. We started those back this past year. Um, and again, what that's allowed us to do is to really um, reach out to a broader, make these resources available to more of our deans. Um, there's a cost with going to a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so for some of our institutions that are not able to afford that, um, we have a virtual um, uh, component. And so that's been well received. So again, I think um, as we've all, as things have changed, we've learned and uh, what were challenges have now become excellent opportunities for us uh, to expand our leadership development and our networking opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores, and uh, thank you for that background. Um, I think uh, we, we've already, uh, Patrick has shared with us um, a question uh, that was in the chat. Um, I think it, it was very important for us, as I mentioned earlier, kind of set the context uh, for our engagement today. And, and we will again encourage you to, inter to interact with us. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to get perspectives on this issue from the global north and the global south at the same time. So, <laughs> so here's the opportunity. So the question, Dolores, um, that we've seen in the chat is, where does the leadership uh, journey start? Um, are we across the sector consciously creating that pipeline? And that's a question to both us in Helm and, mm -hmm. and CAS. Um, and let me start by saying, I, I think you, you, I think our, our approach, our philosophy in Helm is one we talk. We don't. We don't advocate for a deficit assumption. You know, we're, we're in programs or training. You need to fix people because they have weaknesses and gaps, uh, and that's the kind of you know uh, nomenclature we use a decade or so ago, and sometimes still use a narrative that says you know where are your gaps, where are your weaknesses, how do I have to fix you? We talk about the developmental orientation, which advances this idea that everyone, and I mean everyone, has potential for leadership. So um, I think the sooner one can, can identify that and unearth it and, and, and kind of create fertile ground for it to grow, the better. So for us in how um, our biggest challenge in South African universities, I'm not sure if it's a similar challenge in the US, but um, when we get to the highest level of leadership, which is our vice chancellors, the pool is becoming smaller and smaller. And people are just not stepping up. Uh, mm. They say they don't need this, you know. So that used to be, and it's still a massive problem for us. And what sometimes happens is, um, and I can say this now because I don't work for a vice chancellor any longer, that we kind of get recycled. People move around. There's no new blood yeah. coming in. So then we realized the problem has gone even lower to the next level 
of deputy vice chancellors, uh, where there's not a sufficient pool, a good enough pool for vice star. And, and I think right down, so we've started, the approach we've taken uh, is to start with the HODs for practical reasons more than anything else, because we just didn't have the capacity to do everyone. Ideally, if we had all the money and the resources in health, we could start with every new person that's appointed either in the administration or, or the academia uh, at the university, but that's not possible. Uh, I think also, so that's helped us to create the pool. So our kind of philosophy uh, is if we have a good pool of HODs, heads of departments, chairs of departments, it's a good pool for deanship. And if you've got a good pool for deanship, you've got a better pool for DVC ship mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But I think what we've realized, I think, you know, uh, and since we've been back kind of in this space since 2018 uh, in South Africa, in Helm, was that you got to go even lower. So, so, so I talked earlier about a program called University Lectures Development Program that we had an opportunity, came out of the need for, for, new, for new thinking, a new generation of lecturers. And we said, look, we'll take it on with a proviso that you build in uh, educational leadership as part of the themes or the areas that they will cover. So the intention is that as a lecturer even, you can start your leadership journey uh, within your university and then, and then build it. And I think then it's also important to plot with you the course that you take uh, on your leadership journey. And that's what we're hoping to do, the kind of levels, functional levels of, of interventions that we, do, do we design and deliver at home. I think there's still a very strong focus on the individual because that's where the starting point is. But we're now shifting our attention to working with teams in organizations because often we know from our experience of, of fantastic leadership development programs is you go back to sometimes very disabling and sometimes even toxic uh, you know, organizational environments and you lose the value of that intervention very quickly. Let me pause there and ask you for your comments on this, um, Dolores. Yeah, I, I think through in... I would um, conceptualize this with us in CCAS is that through our trainings, through our seminars for new deans uh, and new department chairs is, is the conversation of uh, creating your pipeline and uh, succession planning. And so I think as we develop and strengthen and um, provide resources to our deans and part of the conversations, even with department chairs, is, is that is part of the conversation is, you know, it's, it's beyond the individual. If the, uh, the, um, the uh, development of the leader, um, if that's the chair or, the, you know, cause we are working with one individual, but when they go back to their campus, um, our hope is that they're brought in their way of thinking and that um, we highlight the fact that um, higher education, the need for succession planning, the need for creating emerging mm. leaders. Um, mm. And so that they're taking back to their uh, campus uh, to create that kind of team, as you said, mm. Oliver, is, is, you know, through that individual for us, at least how we're structured, that that's part of what the conversations are, is mm. to take this back to mm. create that kind of leadership. Um, I know at our university, we just in the last three years um, have created some leadership academies on campus, mm. which involves staff, faculty, and we have an emerging leadership academy. And we also have four current leaders, individuals who are in like director positions and and we bring them together. So it's it's really, you know, it's holistic on a university. Mm. It's not just faculty. It's a holistic team of multiple parts that are individuals that are needed, right? So I think from us, from our perspective at CCAS is um, our responsibility is to have that conversation as part of the leadership development to the deans that we work with mm -hmm. or the uh, department chairs and that that message goes back. And, you know, and, and so it, it, you're, it's a trickle down. <laughs> at this point, but um, I think that we do tend to see, then we do see chairs who end up back, you know, we see them as deans, um, but we're hopefully creating that, helping create pathways um, in terms of the influence or the impact we're having at our level of leadership development 
that that is also going back to the that will make a change in the system of what they're where they're going back to. Thank you much, uh, very much, uh, Dolores. I think it's also important. I mean, I, I this no notion of of evidence based uh, mm -hmm. interventions. I think uh, we we Sorry. we are academic institutions, but we fail ourselves in terms of trying to determine what can support you know mm -hmm. uh, people on their leadership journey, whether they're starting out, whether they're mid career, or whether they're coming through the kind of sunset parts of their careers. So I think that's very important. I think also the time for reflection, the time for individual reflection, mm -hmm. you know, and then group and collective reflection to, to give kind of insights um, into what's needed and how does one respond to this. I think that continuous ongoing uh, self-examination mm -hmm. uh, within, you know, your, your own personal leadership journey, but also then equally important as part of a team. Um, and I think that's been interesting. I mentioned yesterday in my presentation, the shift in focus, in particular, some very interesting research that's been done in the Australian education system around distributed uh, leadership in the mm -hmm. academy. Um, and so that's where you see people taking on different roles, because as I mentioned, everyone has the, the potential for leadership. And if you the leader, you may be leading from the front, from, from the back, or from within, from you know, within. in that particular. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the kind of the, the communal kind of Common, common approach that, that one wants to try and adopt. Right. Okay. And we're there, we're a, actually, yep. I'm sorry, I, I think no. you, you were talking about evidence-based and that part of our new strategic plan is to do more data collection mm -hmm. and to, you know, we, we do have access to information that mm -hmm. we, we are trying to figure out how we can actually support some mm -hmm. of what our assumptions or what we've been doing. Right. I think there's another question, and please keep them coming, uh, colleagues. Again, as an opportunity uh, for you to engage with us um, uh, during this time. Um, the question is, how do your two organizations collaborate nationally um, while institutions are inevitably in competition uh, with each other? Um, did COVID change your modus operandi? Uh, let me let you let me let you go first this time, Dolores. <laughs> I'm going to let you answer that. I didn't, I guess I'm not seeing the question. So I, um, could you repeat it? Because I, yes. I, I'm let me, let me repeat I it. Let me, so yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Let me repeat it. It's how do your two organizations collaborate nationally while institutions are inevitably in competition with each other? Mm -hmm. And then the second part is did COVID change your modus operandi? Well, we are new partners with Helm. Um, I'm assuming that's where the question is about CCAS and Helm. Um, we're new partners and we actually uh, began the partnership during COVID. Um, and so I think that we can, uh, the partnership and the collaboration is, is not a competitive collaboration. I think that we can enhance each other. We bring different, um, kind of structures to the table. And, and I think we can, each, each of us can learn from the other in terms of enhancing our organizations and how we support and provide the leadership network. We're also expanding it to um, one of the things it's been, um, I, I've really enjoyed the summit is, and as I did the panel yesterday, there are some common themes across mm. common issues and common challenges, no matter where we're at. And so mm. I think that allows, and that really, I think provides some, some um, positive um, input conversations to maybe reframe um, mm. how we're looking at, at our own situations mm. in our own context. Right. And um, and I, I think that's a benefit, not a co not a contradict a competition kind of situation. Thanks, uh, Dolores. I think also there's two parts. I mean, at one level is we, we kind of both national organizations um, in, in what the work that we do um, within our university system is still quite, uh, quite uh, lots of competition. Um, you know, for, and I think it's all, I mean, I always say I'm, I'm not an advocate for ranking, <laughs> you know, everybody's chasing the rankings, um, of mm -hmm. course, for various reasons, and that's just the way the system works. 
But I think um, in this context, uh, we, we have the work that we do in how we say it's in the national interest. Uh, it's a national project, um, you know, and I think that's the kind of approach that we've adopted here. And so when we have universities that would normally be fierce competitors out there for students, for staff, you know, for research projects, for funding and so on, when they come into this space, it's a safe enough space. It's a, it's a kind of ground leveling space where we support each other and we share the kind of experiences that people have, you know, that, that, that can support. I think the networks that has been built up. And I think one of the reasons we, for example, went um, the, the, the role functional level was for deans, HODs, because there's, there's a peer to peer connection, which you ordinarily will not have outside of your university, you know, and mm -hmm. often even within their universities, uh, people don't have that kind of support that don't have that community uh, that that can assist, especially when they knew um, in, in their particular role. Okay, so the next question is how lonely is the dean? <laughs> Uh, that's loaded. I mean, it's uh, that's the first part. <laughs> yeah, and then let's let's deal with that one first because the second part is around HODs. Um, it says, uh, how lonely is the dean? The second part of the question is, HODs or heads of departments still uh, belong to the family of the department or school that no longer exists at dean level. So how do we specifically empower them by, by empowering the dean I mean, so how lonely is the dean? When you shift, I would say you, you kind of become more like a general manager as opposed to a, <laughs> a field specialist. Um, and how does it work and how do you relate? Uh, and that's interesting because I also make comments from my experience uh, here with the deans. Uh, you want to respond to that, Dolores? Um, well, I don't know. I, I don't, the word lonely kind of, um, mm -hmm doesn't quite resonate with me. Um, I think that, yes, you do become, as Oliver, you called it a general manager, uh, but you're, you are still, um, I think that depends on the individual, to be honest. I, I, I don't think that, um, I think you can make it lonely. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, you're still you it's how you frame it it's how you frame your role with with your department chairs or your departments to me we're a team so mm -hmm. i have a leadership team and mm -hmm. i think when you work it depends on your how you frame your position and so i i am the dean but i have a team mm -hmm. and so I think my communications and the way you structure that, how you create the environment you create, how you create that is, is part of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's part of the who you are as a, or that's part of creating that leadership position. And I think nowadays when we talk about leadership, it is um, much more collaborative um, and not so much top person and everybody below that, you know, that kind of structure, hierarchy structure. Mm. Um, so I, I think you can work within that. And if you do, um, then it's not lonely. Um, then you are, you're part of the team. Um, at the end of the day, you do have to make the final decisions, but, mm. but you can still allow for the conversations of input. And if, if your team feels like, you know, I've said this, and this is you. This this is what I'm proposing, but this is why we can't do it. So again, I think it's it's about leadership, um, how you manage that, your leadership styles, and and the hope is that when we do development training, that that is part of what the conversations we're having. Thanks, Dolores. I think yeah, from my own uh, research too. I mean, I uh, the study that I did. Uh, for my doctorate was was around deanship um, in in six um, of our universities in our province in the Gauteng province and there were different types of universities it was interesting the dean's experience there from the well-established well-endowed universities you know um, to at the much lower end where you basically were an administrator chief administrator mm -hmm. you know and just with the title of dean um, I think um, what, what we saw very interestingly in my engagement with the deans among you know, that kind of loneliness is you, you kind of sometimes lose yourself and your identity because 
I often say, um, you didn't sign up if you're in the academy, you didn't sign up for the love of management. <laughs> you signed <laughs> up for the love of your discipline, you know, mm -hmm. and I think, and, and sometimes in, in our system in particular, when you shift your focus from your discipline and when you're going to deanship, you're now, in, you're now kind of responsible for, for a wider variety of disciplines, you know, I mean, that may not necessarily be in your own field of expertise, but that's where the team dimension comes in. Uh, mm -hmm. Dolores, I think the old saying around smart leaders around them, smart by smarter people, mm -hmm. you know, that holds because uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an academic intellectual environment, you've got to concede when you, you, that you don't know everything, you know, that exactly. you, you're not all being and all seeing and all doing. And then lean on your team, the sooner you can kind of find those people that you can build this trust relationship with in your team. And okay. then, and then you, 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 you let it go. Um, I think that is a critical component. And I think that kind of goes back to the way you've been wired as an academic. You know, when, when you've been in academia for 15, 20 years, you know, you, you've been wired in a way that says it's about my, my scholarship, my performance, my publication, my students, my credibility, my standing in my discipline. And suddenly you have to shift into this environment where I say it's, it's more of less of I-ness or me-ness and more of us-ness and we-ness. Suddenly you, you, you're thrown into a situation where you need to, to, to lead a team. And I think that is, is critical in that journey. And the, the sooner you cop it, I think the sooner you understand that you need the team and you need a good team, mm -hmm. you know, and that people, some people are going to be better and smarter, no more than you do. Mm -hmm. you know, the better uh, that that is for you. So I think also that shift, I think um, what people found particularly difficult, Deans, was this management by remote during COVID. You mm -hmm. know, um, I mean, they say trying to, to lead or manage academics is like herding cats. And you can imagine <laughs> if you yeah. don't have them in line of sight, you know, as mm -hmm. you would do, um, you know, what happens and how do you deal with that when you're trying to manage them uh, by remote. Okay, I see there's, a, there's another question. Yeah, the question is, um, I'll hand over to you, Dolores, first up. How important is coaching in our education leadership in the US and in South Africa? Your thoughts on that? It's imperative. Um, coaching and mentorship, um, we actually are, we're, are having that conversation in CCAS about um, creating a more you know, a clear structure of how we make that available to our to our uh, members in terms of, um, I think we had a conversation about coaching, mentoring, and mm -hmm. sponsorship and the differences mm -hmm. across those and for us to be clear what people need. Um, and so I, I think it's imperative for, um, in terms of having uh, uh, someone to go to especially, and I don't think it's only new deans or new administrators. I think at different points in our careers, however, you know, you, you cross different challenges. And mm. so it's important to be able to connect individuals to that. Thanks, Dolores. I think also the, the, we've also introduced coaching uh, for the first time into our Women in Leadership program, uh, and it's now in its third year. Exactly. And I think when I, I think I was uh, one of those people that was very cynical and critical of coaching. <laughs> uh, you know, when it started, I thought one of those fatty things, you know, it was very kind of psychotherapeutic, therapy, you know, therapy. Um, but it's evolved to the extent where uh, we are saying that, that you need for us and perhaps that's a conversation, a shared conversation we should have at CSA. It's, mm -hmm. it's not just the kind of executive coach approach, you know, mm -hmm. that comes from a different environment, but on somebody that probably understands how universities work, you know, mm -hmm. what I mean, the uniqueness of, of a university, right. of professional bureaucracy, of what makes it tick, and so on and so forth. So our, 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 what we've done is one of the requirements we've put in place is to ensure that at least the coaches we appoint have that exposure, have that experience. Now, of course, coaching is not, uh, it, it really is, it's a process, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a methodology that you use to just listen to what people are saying and, and support them, and, you know, and, 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 and kind of put them on the, on the, on the right track. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that, that you, you don't have that mismatch between, you know, what's the expectation of the coach and the expectation mm -hmm. of the coachee, you know, and I think by similar, by similar vein, I mean, also the, the, the idea of mentoring uh, in our education system, especially as you grow up. I mean, all of us in our careers 
have informal mentors. I mean, I still mm -hmm. you know, defer to, to, to some of them when, when I need to. And I think that that process um, is also uh, very important. So I think that's something uh, that we could we could look at um, jointly, you know what I mean, that we can engage I on, yeah, work on. I think also in the, you know, we have a, a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. And I think that those components are really important for that. Uh, how else will someone know how, you know, the processes work and what's necessary? Um, you, you know, it's not something you have a book to read on, you know, because there's a lot of those informal mm -hmm. kind of processes, um, interactions and um, strategies that you need to be aware of. So um, I, I think it, it's a great place for us to build up, you know, to work, collaborate on. But mm -hmm. I do see how important it is. Yeah, I think also just to share, I mean, I think um, from our Women's in Leadership program, I mean, we, we set up the peer learning groups. I mean, it was interesting to see how that dynamic worked because often in a big group, you, you don't feel that empowered to, mm -hmm. to share, you know what I mean, and to engage and to kind of, in a sense, uh, open up your heart. Um, and we found that uh, even with the first cohort that started in 2020, they're still engaging, you know, they've become their own network community of, of women leaders in mm -hmm. the university. And I think those kind of structures to put them in place, it, it, it does help because often it's a case where, where you have an intervention and I was kind of the biggest critic of that being a development leadership development practitioner says, so what, you know, how does that change you? How does that change the world that, that you operate in? So I think that continuous, you know, investment, continuous growth and exposure through a network, through a community. And, and as I mentioned, in, our, in, our, in, in some of our universities, uh, you don't find an environment that's enabling. And then often you have to look beyond the walls of your own universities to others, perhaps in your discipline or in your, you know, in your field or in the similar faculty that, that, that you're operating. So there's another comment, I think, um, and then we should wrap up around competition. It says, uh, perhaps co-opetition is an apt way to look at things. Um, uh, although competition is inevitable in a free market system, there are myriad of sector related matters, for example, higher education, leadership and management development on which to collaborate to the benefit of all. I suppose, yeah, that probably just endorses the earlier comment mm -hmm. we made around, you know, I think COVID taught us that, that we have to work together um, at institutional level and at regional and national level, I mean, mm -hmm. if we're going to succeed and, and see uh, our time through this, uh, you know, through this, this change in development. So then there's another question. This is, how do you see your organization in a couple of years' time? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we need some, some prophesying or what Sue <laughs> say, <laughs> or crystal balling. Dolores? Ooh. Well, um, since we we are in the process of in you know launching our new strategic plan, um, we are looking at you know growing our partnerships, particularly. I mean, this to today and yesterday and this you know uh, summit has been a wonderful step for us, and um, we're looking forward to to growing that. And um, the conversation we just had about coaching, and I mean, mm -hmm. there's several areas in terms of us in our collaborate, our international partnerships, yeah. our global yeah. partnerships as an organization. Um, and then also we continue to learn and evolve in our uh, creation of leadership development programs and networks. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're taking a, a step to really try to um, collect the data and mm -hmm. and to document and and use evidence based uh, practices in in how in in meeting our our goals moving forward. Um, we have also a um, clear uh, commitment to diversity, equity, mm -hmm. um, and inclusiveness in terms of. Uh, we will be having some work groups that are focused mm -hmm. on that and uh, partnerships with some of our uh, minority serving institutions mm -hmm. in the United States 
So those are kind of some top um, mm. object goals that we're looking at as, as in the next few years to really move the organization, continue to, to grow and, mm. and adapt as an organization to our current environment. I think it's it's fascinating. I mean that that your organization has been around since 1965. So I guess <laughs> over that period of time, <laughs> you've learned yes. some some odd lessons, and, and the fact mm-hmm. that you you're still alive and well and mm-hmm. on the growth trajectory speaks to the need uh, of what CSAS is doing and and how you're kind of hitting the mark. I think uh, we we're in the same position, Helm. Although we kind of really took off from 2018. Uh, with the support of the Department of Higher Education and Training, which is our government uh, department, through their funding that they provide for, for HELM. Um, it's been around since 2002. And I think we've seen this need uh, for, for kind of continuous support for, for university leadership, university management, and, and how that has evolved uh, for us in particular, um, going from individual focus, as we said now, for specific roles, shifting into the EDI environment. Um, that was a fascinating shift for us um, because I think you one looked at the kind of trends and debates, you know, there was kind of one school of thought and saying, well, why are you having specific targeted program for women? Is this that women just make them any different for people of color as opposed to others? And then there was another school of thought that said, well, you know, this is a particular problem, you know, patriarchy, the issue of disabling environments, the lack of opportunities and so on and so forth, which is a global problem. How does one, and perhaps, you know, having a kind of dedicated uh, focus program in that area, um, you know, does help. And we've seen that. I think that there were some people who were a bit skeptical when we started out in 2020 on this path, but I think we've learned some, some very good lessons, um, you know, on that. And I think particularly also on how, important that that kind of uh, approach, end-to-end approach. So assisting people, preparing them for this new role, then, you know, adequately supporting them in the role, and then helping them to transcend, transition out of the role to their next life. Uh, often in our education system, we, we invest so much time and energy to developing a dean and the dean's team. And then when the tenure of the dean is over, they just kind of disappear. That's in, you know, <laughs> right off into the sunset and, and you mm-hmm. lose the value. And there's a skill set, there's a knowledge base, there's a kind of, uh, you know, that you can actually use uh, in for other purposes in the academy. And then some universities uh, have policies in that respect. Final kind of comments from your side, Dolores, around kind of things, three or four things that make for effective kind of leadership learning networks, communities from your experience at CCAS. And then we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, um, adapting to the changes, just kind of really right off what you just said. You know, I think that the importance in, in uh, sustaining and uh, creating, sustain, creating and sustaining a network of leadership network and communities is to be adaptive and to be responsive to the larger um, issues that are going on, um, it, either in higher ed and also mm-hmm. in our in the country, you know that mm-hmm. that we've got to make those adjustments. I mean, if you think of DEI, that's that's you mm-hmm. know a big part of that influence. But but we have to be uh, responsive to that. And mm-hmm. so I think in sustaining and to keep something su- successful, um, it's ongoing evaluation and review mm-hmm. and and self reflection and self review of what we're doing um we can't just keep doing the same thing over and over yeah. um, and assume that it's it's working because things are changing at such a rapid uh speed in mm-hmm. in the world and so um you know we just this covid we've we've made mm-hmm. a lot of adapting to that and changes and adopting of some of those changes that we, you know, this is possible because I think somebody asked earlier about, you know, the virtual if that's made a change, mm. and it has because mm. it's opened the the opportunities for us to be able to interact in this mm. way and um, and have these conversations. And mm. so, uh, to me, I think the key parts are being uh, adapting and um, being very aware 
of of what's going on and mm. and responding to that. Mm. I agree with you. I think the the other important thing for me is also, I mean, as a leader, you have to have a global perspective. Mm -hmm. I think that's often where we trip ourselves up. Um, I mean, the U.S. is a big, it's a country. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. a combination of various things. And I mean, and and, and so you can get lost in everything U.S. or American and and not realize what's happening beyond your borders. The same in South Africa, we fall into the same trap because some of us think, Africa starts and ends in South Africa. You know, we, we still have some of our colleagues will talk about, I'm going to Africa, you know, as if they're not in Africa, you know, uh-huh. uh, when, they, when they are traveling, for example, for the university and so on. I think, so So starting in your own backyard, you know what mm-hmm. I mean, at a national level, and I think that's what CCAs has done very successfully over a number of years, establishing those networks, becoming trusted uh, networks, mm-hmm. networks that people feel they are enabled and empowered to do stuff and they are supported. Mm-hmm. And then I think also incumbent on us to reach out, you know, beyond the borders of our own countries into the region. I think there's a big need. I mean, I can I can safely say in, in African higher education, we're probably one of the lead players uh, in Helm in this space. Um, and and there's a whole there's a whole Southern African region, there's a whole East African region that, that needs to be developed. And, and I mm-hmm. think incumbent on us also to share that. And I think perhaps through partnerships with organizations like CCAS and others that are specialized in their field. I think in the beginning also, one of the mistakes we made, of course, you, when you're sitting in the global south, you want to play with the big players in global north. And we started talking to ACE, you know, and then you realize ACE is this massive organization, you know, with mm-hmm. a much broader focus than we have. And we shifted our focus. It was specifically now we're talking to ACE, for example, around uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, you know, in respect of our, our gender equity mm-hmm. programs. That's very specialist, very kind of right. niche. And with CCA, it's around deanship, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So I think when you're thinking about partnerships, I think it's beyond just the collaboration. I mean, these days, I think we've moved into what, what I refer to strategic alliances. Mm-hmm. And hopefully this platform, we've started a movement, a global movement, where we can really uh, engender in our leadership a global perspective, you know, beyond the borders of our own country and that experience is shared experience. And as we've learned, uh, there's a lot more in common uh, that there are differences. I think as we wrap up, uh, Dolores, any last comments, remarks from you before we we wrap up the session? Well, I I look forward, um, we look forward to this continued collaboration and, um, and learning from each other. So I appreciate the this session and um, it just, I took some notes of what I think we can continue having conversations with you about in terms of what we can do together. Thank you very much, uh, Dolores. I mean, we're excited. We've been talking to CCAs for a number of years <laughs> <laughs> and Amber knows for the first time we pulled this together and, and you know, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was challenging in some respects. But I think the things that unite us are, are, are much bigger than the things that divide us. Okay. You yes. know what I mean? And so I think we need to build on that. And so on behalf of Dolores and, and myself, I'd really ex- express our deep appreciation uh, to those of you who joined the session today. Uh, we've shared with you our own experiences. Hopefully we will still involve. And the next time you'll see us, it will be even a stronger partnership uh, you know, between CSAs and Helm. Have a good evening. Have a good afternoon. Have a good morning. And we'll see you on the other side. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you very much.